And now we have something really exciting in regards to neutrinos. An exciting report coming out of IceCube Neutrino Detector, an enormous detector that's currently in Antarctica. But before we talk about the detection and what exactly it means, I actually wanted to briefly start with neutrinos in general, just to help you understand why this is kind of important. And that's because one day, there's actually a really big chance that neutrinos, the mysterious, barely understood particles, may actually be able to explain so many different mysteries of the universe that we currently cannot explain. And that of course includes things like dark matter, but also the idea of Big Bang and what happened in the first second after the formation of the universe. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton, let's discuss some of these recent exciting discoveries in regards to neutrinos once again. But first, okay, but what are they? What exactly is a neutrino? I mean, most of you are probably familiar with protons and neutrons inside various atoms, and of course electrons surrounding them. But despite similarities in the name, neutrinos have nothing to do with neutrons and are actually super weird in comparison. And they're actually only named neutrinos because they're so tiny in terms of mass and because they're neutral, just like neutrons. They don't have any electrical charge. But unlike a lot of other particles, including protons and neutrons, they don't actually interact with anything except for just a little bit of gravitational force and the weak force. And so as a result, they generally go through most matter without touching or interacting with anything. It's extremely difficult to detect them, which is why building an enormous neutrino detector is really the only way to even see them. For example, here's the overall size of the IceCube neutrino detector. It is absolutely enormous, but it's only able to detect one or two neutrinos once in a while. Simply because their mass is so low, so gravitationally they don't really interact with pretty much anything, they also have no charge, so no electromagnetic interaction, and most importantly, they don't interact with anything through strong force. But what's even stranger, ever since you began watching this video, roughly around a trillion neutrinos pass through your whole body without really doing anything, without you feeling them, without them interacting with your body, and basically the only way we even know they pass through you is through various experiments we're going to be discussing very soon. And so in essence, neutrinos are believed to be some of the most common subatomic particles in the entire universe. There are so numerous, and there are so many of them out there, that naturally they've been also used as a potential explanation for dark matter. Even though their mass is so tiny, because there are so many of them everywhere, they're essentially one of the biggest contenders in terms of explaining dark matter observations. But despite years and years of knowing about them, we basically still know so little about their actual properties, including their mass. And more importantly, we still have trouble finding sources of neutrinos, or basically where some of them actually come from. But today it's believed that most of them are very likely the result of radioactive decay. So basically various nuclear reactions inside stars and also inside planets but also naturally produced by things like supernova, cosmic ray interaction, and maybe even inside pulsars and neutron stars. And so here on Earth, the majority of neutrinos are believed to be coming from the Sun, specifically from the nuclear reactions inside the Sun, which result in the production of energy, which surprisingly actually gets stuck inside the Sun for up to a million years, very very slowly making its way out of the Sun, but neutrinos go through everything, so they actually leave right away. And here it's actually important to talk about one of the first experiments and one of the first mysteries in regards to these unusual particles. It's known as the Homestake experiment, named after the Homestake gold mine, where all of this was performed. Here are the actual pictures from this experiment. And this was conducted in the 60s, only a few years after the original discovery of a neutrino, during a slightly different experiment by Fred Rains and Clyde Cohen that you see right here, the experiment that they actually refer to as Project Poltergeist, because searching for neutrinos was literally like looking for ghosts. And so after months of data collection, they were able to discover three neutrino interactions, which eventually resulted in the Nobel Prize something like 40 years later. And so now that we knew neutrinos exist, researchers wanted to find out how many come from the Sun. And they actually made a prediction about how many we should be detecting. But once the experiment was conducted, the numbers detected were different, by a factor of 3, 
which created a bit of a problem. The predictions and the experiment were not agreeing. And so either our sun was different from what we thought it was, producing a tremendously different amount of nuclear energy, or something was wrong with the experiment. But it actually took something like 30 years to confirm that there was no mistake, both were technically correct. Because apparently neutrinos are really strange. Even though right here on Earth we actually expect 65 billion solar neutrinos per second per square centimeters, which is basically why you're getting trillions of neutrinos even watching this video, and by the way it has nothing to do with the video itself, you're going to be getting them either way, and even if it's nighttime, because they do go through planet Earth without much trouble, the actual number detected is going to be different, and there's a reason for that. Neutrinos by themselves have three different flavors or three different types. We have the electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino, which basically corresponds to the source of their formation, electrons, muons, or tau particles. Now that's not really important to understand, but what is important to understand is that once they become something, they can change and they do change at all times. Or to rephrase this, neutrinos change their flavors or their types as they travel, and they do this at all times, more so in some conditions than others. And so in 1998, additional experiments started to show that solar and atmospheric neutrinos were changing flavors constantly from electron neutrinos with certain mass produced inside the sun to other neutrinos such as tau and muon with a very different mass that was not detectable by Homestake experiment. And that's actually the crazy part. So basically these unusual particles seem to completely change at all times, even changing their own mass. They go from being a little bit less massive to a little bit more massive, and they do so constantly at all times. Which led to an entirely new field of studies. These are known as neutrino oscillations. Here's for example oscillations of neutrinos changing from one type to another depending on the distance traveled. And as you can see, as they travel away from the source, they have a much higher chance to transition into something different. But they basically kind of transition back and forth. As a matter of fact, it really resembles a kind of a oscillation system like the one you see right here. It's technically a quantum system where these particles are not actually one type or another, they're sort of a superposition of different flavors. But more intriguingly, their mass changes all the time. And that's really the strangest part. It's possibly the only particle we know that constantly changes its mass, just by itself, without really anything. Which is once again why it was so difficult to discover them in this experiment and why they're still so difficult to find even now. But this principle of oscillation solved at least that one mystery, the mystery of the Homestake experiment. But what it did not solve is, okay, but what's their mass though? We still have no idea what mass they have, and even the approximate mass we kind of think it has is still not even remotely accurate. Right now it's believed that the sum of all of these masses has to be less than one millionth of an electron. But individual masses of individual flavors is still totally unknown. In case you're wondering in terms of numbers, the upper limit for their mass right now is approximately 2.14 times 10 minus 37 kilograms. So yeah, these are really really tiny. But despite being so tiny and despite moving through most matter, they can still do some things. For example, they can induce nuclear reactions. So basically just like neutrons, neutrinos can induce fission by interacting with certain nuclei, but it just happens extremely rarely. Nevertheless, because they do affect elements, they also increase the abundance of certain isotopes in the rest of the universe, naturally making them kind of important for cosmology and for a lot of studies in astrophysics. Nevertheless, we still know so little about them. As a matter of fact, even today there's really no idea about how many neutrinos exist out there. We just know that there cannot be too many. For example, if the total mass of three types of neutrinos exceeded a certain mass, they would most likely have already collapsed the universe. Here that value is approximately 50 electron volts, or about 10,000 times less massive than an electron. And so we know they cannot be that massive, but in the last few years there's actually been quite a lot of different studies trying to estimate their mass just a little bit more accurately. And so right now the best predictions suggest that it's maybe about less than 0.3 electron volts or maybe as low as 0.11, which is about 5 million times less massive than an electron. And the thing is, if we actually knew their mass directly, it would actually open up an entire new field of studies in pretty much everything. 
Remember, these unusual particles are everywhere and they go through everything. So not only can we use them to scan anything around us, including of course planet Earth, other stars, other planets and so on, there is also this concept known as cosmic neutrino background, something we've discussed in a video in the description, that would actually allow us to understand exactly what happened in the universe in the first second or so, thus pretty much answering most questions we have about cosmology today. Yet despite years and years of attempts, even today the measurements we have are still not really precise. And one of the most recent techniques used in 2024 was by using isotopes of holmium an unusual atom that tends to absorb an electron from its innermost shell, which turns one of its protons into a neutron, converting all of this into dysposium-163, but also producing a neutrino. And so this isotope has been used previously to try to calculate the total mass of the neutrino produced, but even this is apparently super difficult. I mean, I'm not a particle physicist, I only play one on TV, but from what I read about the study and the experiment, essentially using what's known as a pentatrap, the unusual device you see right here, here by watching minute changes in holmium-163, the researchers were finally able to calculate a slightly more accurate value for neutrinos, but it's still only a little bit more precise. To be more exact, they actually looked for what's known as the Q value, which represents the energy required to excite the atom in order to change holmium into dysposium and to then produce a neutrino. But long story short, the actual mass is still unknown. Which also means that the neutrino astronomy is still kind of stuck in limbo. There are still limited means we have to detect neutrinos, and we're still basically more or less blind when it comes to the majority of these particles that pass through everything at all times. And a small fun fact. This idea for neutrino astronomy began with the famous SN1987A, the iconic supernova we've discussed recently in one of the videos in the description. And so back in 1987, neutrinos discovered coming from here marked the beginning of neutrino astronomy. This is how we knew supernova can produce them, and this was the first attempt to use neutrinos to study everything inside the supernova. Once again, the video in the description talks about this more. Okay, well following all this, let's talk about the most recent discovery coming out of Antarctica or once again from the IceCube neutrino detector. The enormous network containing thousands of individual detectors that are able to trace everything in three dimensions because as neutrinos pass through ice, they tend to leave certain tracks behind that can be seen by each of these detectors. And all of this once again depends on the type of the neutrino. For example, electron neutrinos, the ones produced by electrons, usually produce a roughly spherical ball of light. So as they move through ice, they leave behind these spherical balls visible to each of the detectors. And so once we have a bunch of these balls everywhere, we can then kind of tell that this is an electron neutrino coming from a certain direction. In contrast, a muon neutrino produced by muons, and these are actually usually produced by the atmosphere, will leave behind a relatively long track, usually hundreds of meters long. But this track will decay pretty quickly, giving researchers a very brief period to detect them. Lastly, tau neutrinos seem to be the hardest to discover. And that's because they kind of blend the two. Sometimes they appear as a track of light, sometimes as a ball of light. And so most of the time they kind of resemble electron neutrinos. And so most of the time they're really difficult to distinguish. However, we know that tau neutrinos are also usually produced by super powerful events. For example, inside massive black holes or during very powerful collisions such as between two neutron stars. And when those super powerful events happen, they also produce very powerful neutrinos. Neutrinos with a lot of energy that instead of producing one single ball of light, will be able to travel a little bit farther, producing two balls slightly separated from one another. And so by looking through some of the oldest data, the researchers were finally able to find quite a few of these for the first time ever. Specifically, they found seven strong candidates by looking at 10 years of observations. And so by calculating their energy, they discovered that all of this was coming from super powerful sources. More powerful than anything on Earth and more powerful than most supernova. So probably things like quasars. And so basically, for the first time ever, researchers were finally able to see tau neutrinos coming from some of the most powerful objects in the entire universe. A lot of these particles had energies in peta electron volts, basically making these some of the most powerful particles ever seen. 
kind of similar to that famous OMG particle that you can learn more about in one of the videos in the description. But once again, only 7 such particles have been discovered so far, out of literally trillions passing through us pretty much every single minute. Which essentially highlights that all of this is still in its infancy. We know so little about neutrinos that it's not even funny. These are some of the most mysterious particles out there, but they also have a chance to potentially explain everything we currently do not understand about the entire universe. And so once neutrino astronomy picks up, and once it becomes a mature field, it's quite likely we'll be able to solve so many cosmological mysteries. Until then though, and until we actually find better ways to look for them, we're still just going to be detecting one or two here and there, and it's still going to be all super mysterious. But I guess, baby steps. And so once the scientists discover something else about neutrinos, or once this facility discovers something else super exciting, we'll definitely come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.